It was an average day. I was doom scrolling through Instagram when something caught my eye on the account of Red Stick Guitar and Amp out of New Orleans. It was this beat to hell 66 Mustang he had found on Craigslist for 1200 bucks. He managed to talk the seller into a more reasonable price, and after that, with a little gentle prodding, he was happy to send it my way, and I was happy to be the recipient. I've never been so excited to own something in such terrible condition. After prodding through a little bit of bubble wrap, thanks for wrapping it so nicely, Kenny. I found it. Oh, yes. I am unreasonably happy about this. After pulling it out of the box, I screwed the neck back on and took a couple glamour shots for Insta. And after that, I immediately began the process of disassembly. See what I had. It turns out absolutely every component of this guitar that didn't melt away or fall off is here, accounted for, original, and complete. I desoldered the pots so I could pull out the electronics. And then I looked at these little fragments of remaining pick guard. What on earth could do this? I just don't understand. The guitar does have a bit of an odor, kind of like Lemon Pledge or Bowling Alley Shoe Deodorizer. Look at these pickups. What melted those? I mean, my guess is fire in that case. But maybe some certain kind of chemical? Uh, now, brace yourself for the most surprising aspect of this rebuild. It's the fact that these pickups are still reading at normal levels, meaning they will still be functioning perfectly. It boggles the mind. A little glance at what we've got underneath the guards. It's all looking pretty good, pretty standard. A little bit of fondling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty. That's Dakota Red paint, what's left of it. The neck you can see is dry as a bone. Uh, the end of it is charred. It's shrunken. And what remains of the fretboard is also shrunken. The tuners still turn fairly smoothly, which is surprising. Here you can see significant chip out damage on top of everything else that's wrong with the neck. To my great surprise, a couple of the side dots managed to hang on. Good work, little buddies. Here I compared it to a 1965 fretboard that's in somewhat better condition. And here are all the parts once removed. Only thing left is to pull off these tuners. Woof, it's crusty under there. There is some bonus material. I think the coolest part of this is the black streaks in the wood underneath the finish. It reminds me of the blue streaks that occur in maple after an ambrosia beetle bores a hole and it gets infected with fungus. I'm not sure you would call it infected. But there is a staining that occurs from a, a fungus delivered by the beetle. 
Sometimes it comes out as red as well, not always blue. I'd just like to take a second to thank Ted Woodford for pointing so many of you in my direction. Welcome to the channel. Let's see if I can remove the rest of the fingerboard. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty easy. Here is the body. I believe that these plain sawn pieces of wood are poplar. I'm just basing that on the Google. A little bit more paint survived on the back than the front. There's a couple of separations in the body panels. I will see what I can do to shore those up with a little bit of clamping and wood glue. Here are the grounding plates. The one on the control cavity has these little spikes soldered on and it makes it a lot more difficult to get out. I did not realize that at first. It was a little frustrating. The foam pad that keeps the wires from the switches from grounding out is still here. Obviously, I'm going to keep that, put it away right here for later. And then I start brushing old meth mouth's teeth here, because I know it's probably been a while. And, oh, don't worry, I'm keeping the original melted, crusty old foam and gluing it back on. Voila, as they say in France. I did end up having to switch out the switches because, damn, these things barely work even when they're not in a meth stang. And my friend Les, Godfrey Guitars sent me these new switches. They work perfect. And then I pulled the pickguard off my 1965 Mustang, made a template out of paper, and got, did a little more detail work in situ. And then I pasted that to a piece of acrylic, and I cut it out. Unfortunately, there are some corrupt files. That's why you're seeing a lot of still photos. But as you'll see in the future, Worry not, you will still get to see me make a pick guard because this one has some issues that will turn up a little later. I ended up having to route very large holes for these weird melted pickups. Then I decided to tackle this crack. Wasn't too hard, I just had to Squeeze a little glue in between, clamp it up, and I left it overnight. Turned out great. Here it is with the guard in place. I did forget to drill out one of the mounting holes. And then I moved on to the fretboard. Again, I'm missing some footage here, but here is the slotted board. And I tried out white dots like the original, but didn't like it. And then I remembered I had these black dowels I got from Benjamin Brockway at Brockway Strings. And they were the perfect choice. Then another pal helped me out. Morgan Farrell from over at Coloma Guitars in Vancouver happened to be visiting the island and was kind enough to bring over a 7.25 inch radius sanding block which I did not have and that allowed me to complete the radiusing. That removed quite a bit of material so I had to slot the rest of the slots by hand all over again. Then I made a little depth checker out of a 
fret fragment, you file off the tangs, and you can shove it in the slot, and make sure that your frets are going to be able to be fully seated, not run into some problematic wood underneath. After that's complete, I chamfer my slots. That means I'm just rounding the edges at the top a little bit. This will help prevent chip out in the instance that someone else has to pull the frets out. This is sort of a do unto others situation where if you do good work, you hope good work comes to you next time you have to do a refret. Speaking of frets, these ones stabbed me. A little bit of blood is pretty normal in this game but I won in the end, and they complied. Here is my sophisticated neck jig I'm going to use for the leveling process. Under my desk is a Dan Erlewine jig that I got used and I have never assembled, but I intend on it. I do get some spaghetti necks around here every now and again. I take leveling a little literally. I glue my sandpaper to this actual level. I marked the frets with Sharpie, I did an initial pass, and you can see the low spots are where the marker is still visible. I came back in and did a second pass in a perpendicular to the fret motion. Or is this parallel? I guess it's a parallel. Anyway, let's get that over with. And after I've kissed the top of every fret, there's no more Sharpie visible and the leveling is complete. Then I moved on to cleaning up a little of the excess fret ends. This is more of a process of feel and sight and sound. And then I moved on to beveling. This I made myself out of koa. Anyone can do this. If you have a table saw, you set it to the degree angle you want. In my case, I used 20 degrees. I think 30 is the industry standard, but I kept beveling until I kissed the edge of the fretboard itself. That way I know I beveled all the way down the fret end and also I can calm the edge on this fretboard because it's brand new and it's pretty sharp. I started out with a Z file here, but Really, I prefer the triangle file in some instances because you get to see and feel what you're doing a little bit better. I'm not in either camp about which one is the best per se. There are certainly instances where only the triangle file will work, such as in very, very small frets, which I encounter a lot on the antique instruments I work on most often. After crowning them, I dress the ends, and then I ran through a multitude of sandpapers. I started at 800 and worked my way up to 2000 before moving on to buffing the frets with my Dremel. Now I did have an instance recently where I was buffing out the frets on a guitar and the Dremel heated them up so much it melted the glue that was holding the frets. And in some instances, the glue is holding the fret down because the tang isn't quite sufficient. And if you melt that glue, the frets are gonna pop back up. So limit the amount of time that you buff your frets so you don't run into this issue like I did. Here they are, all shiny and satisfying. Now it's time for a nut. I had this little fragment. In this configuration, it's too loose, but I flipped it over, and the other side was just a hair tight, which is perfect. That means a little bit of sanding, and it will get in there nice and snug. Pardon the dirty nails. It's a dirty job. I'm a dirty dude. And voila, a nice snug nut. Now I use my $200 pencil to mark a rough place where I wanna saw this nut down. It's still plenty of material left on there, but 
I like to leave extra because I'm going to make a mistake. And in this case, the mistake was quite a big chip out of the treble side, but once this is shaved down to size, and shaped and rounded and smooth and shiny, that chip will be but a distant memory. After that's roughly to size, I start out by slotting the low E and the high E. And once those are in position, I use my Stumac nut slotting ruler and mark the other four slot locations. Now, instead of getting right back to work, I test out the guitar. As suspected, it's fucking fun. Okay, back to business. I'm just roughing in the slots at this point. It's not until I have the nut on the instrument and the strings installed that I can file them to their final depth. And here you can see the spacing issue I've got, especially on the bridge pickup. Uh, I did trace the pickguard from a 1965, so I assumed the positioning would be accurate, but with the weird shape of the melted pickups, things just didn't line up. So I'm going to have to move the neck pickup over a half a millimeter and the bridge pickup over 2.75 millimeters, and I figure as long as I'm remaking the guard, I might as well adjust the angle of the switches so that they line up with the cavity. These two were traced from the original 65 guard, but now that it's transparent, it'd be nice if they lined up with the routing. Interestingly, there doesn't seem to be a volume discrepancy between the high E and the other strings. At least not an appreciable one. Makes you think a little more thoughtfully about magnetic fields. So let's take this guard off and do it again. I'm also going to have to plug some of these screw holes because they are stripped out. Okay, let's make another guard. Here I'm adding some Koa straps as spacers and using the first guard as a template to make my second guard. You need a little space between them because there's a little space between the bearing and the cutting edge on these router bits. These are very cheap garage sale tools. You don't need fancy stuff to do this. Now I need to add a bevel to the guard. These are 25 to 30 degrees originally, but I only have a 45 degree bit, so that'll have to do. Here, you can tell by the look of disappointment on my face, something went awry. And that is, I beveled the back of the guard. What that means is this is now a left-handed clear acrylic guard. Whoops. Well, I'm pretty sure that was the last piece of 
clear acrylic I have on hand. Um, I have more of this red stuff. It won't show the Mustang in all its glory, but it would be complimentary. I also have a bunch of this smoked acrylic, and that seemed apt in a way because meth stang, smoked, etc. So I decided to cut one of those out. I even put the bevel on the front this time. I tried it out. It looked cool, but it's just not the look I'm going for on this one. I asked Buggy what he thought, and yeah, that's gonna be a no. So I went to the store, bought another piece of acrylic for too much money. Luckily, I haven't cleaned up yet. Take four. Do as I say, not as I do, Luke. Wear a damn mask. Here's what it would look like if I left the guards on the pit guard. White, not good. I use my awl to mark the centers of all the screw holes. If I was really on my game, I would then drill a pilot hole as a guide for the final hole, but I didn't. Ooh, drill press is a little cold. That's better. I drilled out all the holes. And, ooh, there it is, holier than thou. Routed out the pickups, and then hand cut out the switch slots. This was a pain in the butt. I wish I had a jig for this. Maybe a smaller template bit for a router? I don't know. Screwed her on and then did the epic plastic pull. Hey, Levon. What's up? You didn't spend your entire workday making a fourth pick guard for the meth stand, did you? No. Did I mention I'm also an actor? Acting brilliant! Now watch this. You gotta go backwards first. Listen for the screw to clunk into the threads. Otherwise, you're gonna strip it out. Listen. Once you hear that clunk, you can switch directions and start screwing it in. Otherwise, you're going to strip the hole, and there's no need for that. Another delay in the meth stang. I was stringing it up, and I heard a terrible clunk come from underneath the tailpiece. So I have to have a look. Oh, so I'll put that out of first. Let's see what happened. Huh. Looks pretty normal. I see. It's riding on the threads instead of on this little uh, tapered slot. I don't know what that's called, but I think pretty easy to just... There we go. Oh, now it's back up. Okay, we're good. The post holes for the bridge are too close together and the tailpiece won't seat properly. I have a brilliant idea. As I was saying, you don't really need fancy tools to build guitars. I mean, there are some very helpful tools that are excellent investments. These files are one. But before I had any tools, I just had a 
a jigsaw and some cheap Chinese chisels that were dull and I made this. Uh, I borrowed a neighbor's clamps to glue the plywood to the back and to glue the neck together. Um, but yeah, just work with what you got. You can see right here this jig I'm using to hold the neck is a, <laughs> a jeweler's vise or whatever kind of vise this is clamped to a table with an off cut of Mabel. Yeah. Just do what you can with what you got. Okay, just one last string slot to get down to depth, and then I can shape and polish the nut the rest of the way. And, oh my God. Guys, it's done. The meth stang is upon us. You didn't think I'd do you dirty like that. I know you want to hear this thing. Here it is. I'm about to plug it in and give you a little bit of a taste of what this puppy sounds like. Thanks for joining me. Hope you enjoy the Mustang. <laughs>